Uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion 23226 in the name of Donald Cameron on care homes. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons down. I call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move the motion. Mr Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by moving the motion in my name? I'm grateful to open this important debate, particularly in light of last week's uh, delayed report by Public Health Scotland. I want to begin by paying tribute uh, to all of Scotland's care workers who have been at the forefront of protecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society, whether it is those who work in a care home, those who deliver care at home, or those who simply look after a relative or friend. We thank you for all that you do and all that you continue to do. The, the unpredictable nature of COVID-19, especially in the early stages of the pandemic in March and April, this year has created significant challenges for the care sector, but those at the front line have been quick to adapt to the new reality that we face. Protecting those who receive care must always be at the forefront of our minds, but it's also clear, I'm afraid to say, that there have been significant and costly mistakes that have been made during the course of this year. Mistakes made by this SNP government, which may have cost lives. At the heart of the detailed report from Public Health Scotland released last week was confirmation that 113 COVID positive patients were sent from hospitals to care homes and some 3,061 patients were discharged into care homes without being tested at all. We also know that since the start of the pandemic, there have been 2,048 deaths from coronavirus in our care homes as of today. And as of the 28th of October, 134 adult care homes had a current case of suspected COVID-19. These are serious and concerning figures. And of course, every death from this virus is a terrible, terrible tragedy. There is, however, a lot that remains unknown. We do not yet know the number of positive tests from care homes that suffered outbreaks after receiving a COVID-positive patient. We do not yet know the number of positive tests from care home staff. We do not yet know when precisely the First Minister became aware that COVID positive patients were transferred from hospitals to care homes and what action she took to investigate it. These are serious questions which require serious and urgent answers. And politicians of all political stripes have demanded clarity on numerous occasions from the First Minister, from the Cabinet Secretary and from uh, public bodies such as Public Health Scotland, etc. Regrettably, these answers have not often been forthcoming. This government's failure to protect Scotland's most vulnerable people is a scandal, and I do not shirk from describing it that way. It is clear to us and to others in this chamber that only an immediate public inquiry will hold ministers to account and give grieving families the answers they deserve. Now, of course, I know what the Cabinet Secretary will say to that call. Indeed, it is in her amendment. She says that it is not the time and we must wait till this is over and it is reasonably practicable to do so. But the simple reality is that we do not know when this will all be over. We are currently experiencing a second wave. We may regrettably have a third wave. It could be a matter of months or another year. We do not know. And while we wait, the families of those who died in our care homes will get no answers and no closure. And we owe it to them to get those answers now, not later. And it's precisely because this virus has not gone away that we need to get to the bottom of what went wrong. There is no reason to delay. We can set the wheels in motion today. We can decide terms of reference. We can appoint key personnel. Crucially, we can start to ingather evidence. All of that takes time. And if committees of this parliament or the chamber can operate virtually or in a hybrid function, so can an inquiry. If court trials in Scotland can now, as of today, operate as they used to do before the pandemic, so can an inquiry. Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to cover a few other aspects covered by the report. The report provided particularly damning evidence on the guidance that led to COVID positive patients being transferred into our care homes. We know now that the SNP government did not change that guidance until the 26th of April. And its original guidance of the 30th of March advised that although long-term care facilities have expressed concern about the risks of emissions from a hospital setting, the priority is maximising hospital capacity and steps should be taken 
to ensure flows out from acute hospital are not hindered and, where appropriate, are expedited. We know that it wasn't until the 21st of April that the Cabinet Secretary announced to Parliament that COVID-19 patients discharged from hospital should have given two negative tests. And it then took almost another month before any mention was made about the testing of non-COVID hospital patients. Now, mention is often made of hindsight in this debate. And I have always accepted that at that point in time, in March and April, we did need the capacity within the NHS to deal with an influx of COVID-19 admissions. But any movement of hospital patients into care homes, even then, had to be done safely especially given the virulence and speed of COVID-19 infection, I will in a second, and particularly because care homes were, of course, the abode of many elderly people who were especially vulnerable. It had to be done safely, and it was not done safely. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to the member for taking the intervention, and I'm grateful, too, for his comment about the importance of uh, what was at that point a shared agreement across this chamber in terms of protecting our NHS. Will the member also accept that in terms of doing it safely, the discharge of patients from hospital to any setting, that the guidance on the 13th of March, notwithstanding his point about testing, the guidance on the 13th of March was very clear that there should be a clinical risk assessment. The guidance on the 26th of March from memory was clear that not only should that happen, but put in place particular infection prevention and control steps that, that has been there since 2012 and also required the isolation of individuals in their own homes, as well as significant restriction on communal and other activity for the purpose of safety. Now, I will give you time back, but we don't have a lot of time in hand now, but you will get all your time back, Mr Cameron. Well, in terms of the, the, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the guidance of the 26th of March, that guidance also stated that individuals being discharged from hospital do not routinely need confirmation of a negative COVID-19 test. So we can't uh, pick selectively from the guidance, despite its terms. Now, yesterday I participated in a virtual meeting with our party leader, Douglas Ross, with relatives of care home residents from across Scotland. And some of their stories were heartbreaking. And it's clear that the inability of families to see their loved ones for months on end has taken its toll. One spoke of a father in a care home who has not been told that his wife has died. And every member in this chamber will have experience of constituents who have come to them with these stories. And it's a stark reminder about the human cost of this virus and of the dilemma we face in keeping care home residents safe, but also trying hard to maintain their quality of life. And it underpins why an inquiry is necessary now. The quicker we can learn lessons, the better. It will allow us to understand what happened and move on to a better, safer, more humane system. This is just as much about the future as it is about the past. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, there have been significant failings which have probably led to deaths in our care homes. Every death is a death too many, and the affected families deserve answers. They have waited too long. Now is not the time for delay. Now is the time to take meaningful action. And the only way that can be fulfilled is through an urgent, judge-led public inquiry. It is a simple request, and we call on the Scottish Government to support the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Jean Freeman to speak to and move Amendment 23226.2. Cabinet Secretary, five minutes, please. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, COVID-19 is a cruel virus that is particularly dangerous for the most elderly and vulnerable in our society. In the first wave, as we have heard, the lives of over 2,000 care home residents were lost. That is devastating for their loved ones and for the staff who cared for them. And I will never be able to adequately express my sorrow and condolences to them all. In moving the amendment in my name, I want to be very clear on this. As we have said repeatedly, this government wants and will welcome a public inquiry into the response and handling of this pandemic. That is not in dispute between us and any other party in this chamber. A public inquiry will be critical for a number of reasons, not least the lessons it will draw out for any future government response to a global pandemic, and the critical improvements to any part of the health and social care infrastructure to either keep or introduce in preparation for that. I think the only disagreement today may be in terms of the timing of such an inquiry. Right now, as the number of cases, the rate of test positivity, the numbers of people in hospital and the numbers who have died must make crystal clear to all of us, we remain in the middle of a global pandemic. 
And if our ultimate responsibility as a government is to do all we can to save life, then that, without question, must remain our focus. That is why my amendment timeframes a public inquiry as once the country is through the immediacy of dealing with the pandemic. And I would welcome the engagement of all parties in working with us on its remit and scope. One aspect we should consider together is should or could the inquiry be held on a four-nation basis? Because I am conscious of the experience of families affected by blood-borne infections. After Scotland's Penrose inquiry had reported, the UK government subsequently instigated a UK-wide inquiry. That meant that people affected by that tragedy had to be faced with reliving it twice. A public inquiry, rightly, takes time to reach its conclusions. For example, the Penrose inquiry lasted for seven years. But bluntly, we don't have time to wait. That's why we have commissioned a range of expert investigations, independent investigations, to get us the recommendations we need now to act on for this winter. Members will be familiar with the information I published yesterday supporting the Adult Social Care Winter Preparedness Plan. The evidence paper and the result of the root cause analysis of outbreaks in care homes. These, in addition to last week's independent Public Health Scotland report and the recent care inspector inspectorate inquiry into care at home all will teach us lessons and all fed into that winter plan. Turning first to the Public Health Scotland independent report, it found that although they could not exclude hospital discharge as a factor, it was not the major one where there was an association with outbreaks. The key factor was the size of the care home. I am not dismissing either. Given the highly infectious nature of the disease, any person coming into a care home carries a risk of infection. That's not to blame anyone, that is simply a statement of fact, just as any one of us coming into this chamber carries a risk of infection. As a result, by their very nature, the larger the home, the larger the number of people coming in, whether that be from admissions, whether it is from staff, or whether it is from more visitors and others providing essential supplies. So we need to learn and work out how we can help providers work with that finding. Members know that I have agreed with COSLA that we will continue sustainability funding for social care at the October levels and work with providers and with others during this month to ensure that people get the support they need, the organisations that need support are able to access it and that services can safely be sustained, including as we need to make changes to learn the lessons. Yes. John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. And would you also accept that while hospital patients were incautiously discharged into care homes, uh, many hospital patients were also discharged into the community at the same time, thereby seeding COVID-19 into the community as well as care homes? I can only give you about 30 seconds back, so nearly in your final minute. Yeah. So. Uh, so I don't agree with the uh, member's characterisation of incautiously. I believe that we did what we believed to be right at the time within the resources uh, available to us and we changed that. And of course, yes, round about two thirds of individuals who were discharged went into the community. Uh, the Care Inspectorate's recent inquiry into care at home and housing support services could not have been clearer on the hard work and flexibility of care at home staff to meet the needs of people during the pandemic. And they, of course, along with others, have my grateful thanks for all that they do. Presiding officer, families rightly want answers. If I was one of those families, I'd want those answers too. So I welcome the actions of the Crown to establish the dedicated unit to receive and investigate the reports of COVID-19 deaths, whether through employment or when as a resident in a care home. The findings of this work, which investigates individual cases, will also provide vital information to help make improvements for the future. A public inquiry is undoubtedly important. We have no disagreement on that. But right now, in the middle of the pandemic, with all the resources in care homes and the NHS stretched severely, this is not the time to divert any resource to setting up, as the motion demands, an immediate public inquiry, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I have to say to members, this, in these short debates, there's no time in hand. I have to be really strict uh, for, with timing. So, uh, Monica, I'll call Monica, Monica Lynn to speak to move amendment 2326.1.
and it's a strict four minutes. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. Care homes have been at the epicentre of the COVID-19 crisis and unfortunately the crisis is far from over. Today it has sadly been confirmed that six of my constituents from Caledonian Court Care Home in Falkirk have died in the last few days following an outbreak. So on behalf of Scottish Labour, I extend my sympathies to their loved ones and indeed to everyone who has lost someone special to them during this awful pandemic. And I also want to pay tribute to healthcare workers who have also lost their lives, those who have become ill in the line of duty, and to thank all of the workforce for their ongoing efforts. It is vital that Parliament gives proper attention to the impact of the pandemic response on care home residents and the workforce. So I am grateful to Donald Cameron for tabling the motion and for the opportunity to give these vital matters our attention. We will support the motion because we strongly believe that getting the public inquiry underway is in the public interest. My amendment calls on the government to commence cross-party talks on the inquiry remit. And I think the Cabinet Secretary has made fair points about the Four Nation context and so on. We need to have a discussion about this. My amendment also calls for a human rights-based approach to such an inquiry. The Scottish Human Rights Commission recommend that, and I'm pleased that ministers have already made a commitment to that approach. However, we're not minded to support the government amendment today because it do does not commit to the preliminary work getting underway, and that does risk the inquiry being kicked down the road, possibly until after the election. We recognise that Scottish Care and others would prefer the work to begin later. However, many others have added to the compelling case for action beginning now, including Age Scotland, GMB Scotland and other unions, the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice UK group. So we believe that cross-party work should be happening now so that we can agree the terms of reference, identify where there are gaps in, in data and research and fill those gaps quickly. And I think Donald Cameron touched on this, but the voices of families are really important but so too are the voices and experiences of people who live in care homes and we're not hearing enough about them and they don't have time, Cabinet Secretary, so we have to capture their views. We need to discuss who would lead the inquiry and so on. We can agree these things, Presiding Officer. What has happened in our care homes this year has been a national scandal. I want to thank Neil Findlay uh, for bringing a, a debate on the Amnesty International report as if expendable to the, to the Chamber last night, which is findings and lessons that are applicable to the whole of the UK, but including Scotland. And Amnesty International recommends a full, independent public inquiry without further delay. Because never again can we find ourselves in a situation where older people are discriminated against on the basis of age. The report from Amnesty International concludes that We've had policies during this pandemic which have threatened older people's right to life, their right to health and their right to non-discrimination. And never again can we have a situation where people who are positive with COVID-19 are being discharged into care homes, into an environment with other vulnerable people. My amendment also says that an inquiry should consider the role of Scottish Government guidance in relation to COVID-19 outbreaks in our care homes. I'm afraid that last week the Scottish Government did sound very defensive when questioned about the Public Health Scotland report referenced in the motion. So, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, no one's looking for a blame game to happen here, but we need transparency, we need openness. So I move the amendment in my name and urge that we do work together to agree the terms of the public inquiry and show collective willingness to act swiftly in the interest of public safety. And thank you very much, Ms Lennon. It's very hard to keep to four minutes in this debate, but well done. And I'll call Alison Johnson, also four minutes, please. Um, <clears throat> thank you, presiding officer. And I too would like to begin by thanking all who work in care, and in our care homes. Um, the clapping has ceased, but be in no doubt that we appreciate the great value uh, you, you bring to us all. Calls for public inquiries aren't made lightly, and I appreciate that each and every party in this chamber agrees that there should be a public inquiry, and colleagues who have spoken have outlined their differing views on when such an inquiry should take place. And I'd like to make it clear that if the Conservatives had brought this motion forward earlier in the pandemic, I would have resolutely 
opposed it. But we now know that 2,048 people have died from COVID in Scotland's care homes, that 44% of the total deaths from COVID have occurred in Scotland's care homes, that families across Scotland are grieving. And with loss of life on this scale, in this specific setting, the case for a separate public inquiry on this issue is clear. Now, I appreciate that the government amendment seeks an inquiry into all aspects of the response to the pandemic, and I do too. But including care homes in this essential endeavour, an inquiry of such scope will lead to greater delay. And I'm gravely concerned that those that we need to hear from, they must be given every opportunity to ensure that we can hear from them. If we delay, of course, there's no guarantee that we've learned all lessons. We may continue to put lives at, li at risk due to a lack of complete understanding of what happened. You know, as we know, public inquiries investigate issues of serious public concern. They seek to prevent a recurrence of events that we would always wish to avoid. They need effective information gathering and management. We need to know now that necessary information is securely stored. There'll be a requirement to ask for, to gather evidence, to analyse documents and testimonies. Roles and responsibilities will have to be established, as will the terms of reference. And this must, of course, involve consulting residents and their families, bereaved families, and those working to look after them. All of this will take time. Elderly spouses, partners and families of those who've lost their lives may not be able to wait, and nor should they be asked to. I mean, our shared aim is to save lives and to protect people. The sooner we understand all contributory factors to the truly harrowing death toll in our care homes, the better. So I believe this is an important step to take now to ensure that we're doing all that we need to to best prevent avoidable deaths amongst our oldest citizens. And I welcome the Scottish Government's commissioning of Public Health Scotland to carry out work to identify and report on discharges from NHS hospitals to care homes during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. I welcome the care home review too. I mean, the PHS report states that after accounting for care home size and other care home characteristics, as has been said, the estimated risk of hospital discharge may reduce and is not statistically significant, but this will provide no comfort to those who've lost loved ones. You know, it asks questions about the mitigations that are being put in place in those larger care homes. Um, presiding officer, we understand now what is appropriate PPE in specific settings. We understand now why testing must include asymptomatic people. We understand now why masks are important. But do we understand all of the interlinking factors that have led to the devastating loss of life in our care homes? I do not believe that we do. And we need to learn them now. And the opportunity to do so should not be delayed. And um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I will call Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, what has happened in our care homes is the tragedy of Scotland's pandemic story. Whilst they certainly did not do it out of malice, by sin of omission and commission, this government has failed some of our most vulnerable residents. If you cast your mind back to the foothills of this emergency, our public health priority was at the very start of this outbreak in the pandemic was to manage the spread of the virus in a way that allowed our frontline health services to cope. We all subscribed to that. We all absolutely understood it. In early spring, in those weeks of high infection, the government frantically prepared for the tsunami of COVID cases with the construction of the NHS Louisa Jordan and the rapid decampment of older people from our hospitals into our care homes. The minutes of the Scottish Government's COVID advisory group of 2nd of April cover several topics, but two points stand out in particular. Firstly, that our scientists were struggling to understand how the virus was moving around in Scottish hospitals, despite infection control measures. And secondly, that the government wanted to speed up the movement of elderly patients into Scottish care homes. Presiding officer, the international health community had been screaming 
about asymptomatic viral transmission since January, yet the government accelerated the movement of over 1,500 hospital patients whose COVID status was unknown into care homes who had precious little PPE at the time. In that decision lay what may well become to be regarded as one of the biggest public health disasters led by policy in this country. Our care home deaths are much higher than those recorded elsewhere in these islands. But to make matters worse, we now know that they were also releasing patients into care homes who had tested positive for COVID-19. That put a time bomb into the heart of our, the most vulnerable homes in our country. And that for me and my party is unforgivable. Beyond the early death of care home residents that should have and could have been avoided, another misery that has been visited on the residents of this nation's care homes has, and their families has been in the isolation they have experienced. For the best part of nine months now, tens of thousands of Scottish people living in care homes have had to go without the physical contact or presence of those they love the most. This has caused untold harm on the mental well-being of people who were struggling in any case. Many uh, family members, I think, made a, a very appropriate point to the government in a demonstration that people like myself and Monica Lennon attended outside of this parliament, that family members are not just sightseers. They don't come to a care home uh, just to have a cup of tea. They're there because they care. They want to be part of the physical care for the loved one. They are unpaid family carers, and as such, they take um, health and uh, infection control measures as seriously as any agency or in-house staff would. In fact, they go further, and they made this point to us at the demonstration, that, that family members who go into care homes act also as informal inspectors, and they pick up on problems or things that have been missed or corners that have been cut. And that, I think, has been lost to our care homes in the times that we have uh, been denying them access to them. I'm very grateful for the Scottish Government moving on this. I hope very much that we will start to see life being breathed back into our care homes. But that is not to denigrate the very hard work of our care home staff who have worked tirelessly to make this as bearable as possible. We need to be sure that this continues, but we also need a public inquiry so we can learn the mistakes of the start of this pandemic for the future, um, to avoid the future mistakes that may still come. Thank you very much. Open debate, type four minute speeches. Rachel Hamilton, followed by Emma Harper. Presiding officer, I want to take this time to also thank care home workers for their compassion shown during the pandemic. This is a really important debate. 2,000 people have died from coronavirus in Scotland's care homes. That is 47% of corona deaths, coronavirus deaths in Scotland. The facts speak volumes, but delay, spin and sleight of hand cannot gloss over SNP mistakes that led to the highest care home deaths in the UK. I've just begun, but yes. Cabinet Secretary. Would the member like to elucidate what delay, spin and uh, diversion, I think was the other phrase, uh, I as Cabinet Secretary have engaged in? Rachel Hamilton. Well, I shall, uh, I shall engage the um, Cabinet Secretary on that as I make progress through my speech with the delays and indeed um, publishing guidance uh, that was removed from the government website. Presiding officer, we cannot begin to imagine the anguish experienced by the families who have lost loved ones in care homes. The Scottish Government knew older people were vulnerable, but they threw a match on a petrol-soaked problem, with guidance stating that elderly patients could be discharged from hospital before their tests came back, risking the introduction of yet more infected patients into care homes. When questioned, the Cabinet Secretary for Health admitted that she had not seen absolutely yet, and that's a quote, the guidance before it was revealed it had been published in error and removed from the Scottish Government's website. Families have been let down, and this is nothing short of a scandal, as my colleague Donald Cameron has pointed out. Knowing that constituents of mine were potentially put into danger by the actions of this government is upsetting, but failing to take proper action to investigate why this has happened really rubs salt into the wounds. Furthermore, the Scottish Government report was delayed and the First Minister has still not answered the question about when she knew the COVID positive discharges to care homes were happening. Why was this allowed to happen? 
Families right across Scotland have been left speechless, and now, during these difficult times, they are grieving without knowledge of the full picture. The Scottish Conservatives on these benches will fight to ensure they get those answers. Presiding officer, we need to see more data on what has happened over the past eight months. We know 3,000 patients were transferred without a test, and 113 COVID positive patients were knowingly sent from hospitals to care homes across Scotland. 137 people were discharged from borders hospitals into 20 of the 26 care homes across the borders between 1st of March and the 31st of May 2020. Yet what we don't know is how many positive COVID patients were discharged. This is causing significant concern and a point perhaps the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport can address immediately. It's imperative that this government provides clarity on these statistics at a local level because in my constituency of Ettrick Rocks from Berwickshire, people want answers, and it's the least the SNP can do. This government has demonstrated a complete lack of ownership for this problem, which happened entirely under their watch. The First Minister has still not answered the question of when she first knew about the COVID-positive discharges to care homes and what actions she took to investigate it. It has been the SNP's tactic to blame others for mistakes. Both Nicola Sturgeon and Jean Freeman blame clinicians Yet we know the SNP government had the policy in place. They ignored advice and chose to make these dangerous decisions. When it comes to the detail of the report, they failed to take proper ownership. The SNP government claimed the report does not show a statistical link between the transfer of patients and further spread of the virus. The Public Health Scotland report states they cannot exclude a moderate to large excess risk from a care home receiving a discharge where the last test was positive. I will close there, but it will not bring back our loved ones. We need a full public inquiry now into this national tragedy. Thank you very much. And I call Emma Harper, followed by Neil Finlay. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, COVID-19 is the biggest public health crisis we have faced in our lifetimes, and the impact on care homes across the world has been profound. And every life, life lost to the virus is a tragedy and a loss that will be deeply grieved by loved ones. And I want to send my condolences to anyone who has experienced the loss of a loved one to this serious virus. I also want to thank the care home staff for their invaluable work. And just listening to the contributions so far, I'm reflecting on where I was at the start of this pandemic and where we all were. We didn't know a lot about this virus. I was one of those folks that was eager to return to the NHS front line and help with what Alec Cole Hamilton has just called a tsunami of COVID cases, which we expected to receive in hospitals across Scotland. You know, I, I want to just be clear that the Public Health Scotland analysis does not find statistical evidence that hospital discharges were associated with care home outbreaks. And in direct response to the Conservative motion, the First Minister and the Health Secretary had, have confirmed that a public inquiry will be held, looking into every aspect of the crisis, and that will include what has happened in care homes. However, now in the midst of an increase of cases, a second wave of the virus, it's simply not the time for a public inquiry right now, but I agree it is needed and I welcome the commitment that it will happen. Presiding officer, it is important to note that we have got to this point. The Health Secretary commissioned this public health report in August to identify and report on discharges from hospitals to care homes during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the report was commissioned but because it is right that residents, families, staff and the parliament have accurate data and independent analysis on the transfer of patients to care homes and the impact that we've had in the care homes. Page 41 of the report states, the analysis does not find statistical evidence that hospital discharges of any kind were associated with care home outbreaks. Public Health Scotland also reported that they cannot statistically exclude the presence of a small risk from hospital discharge. However, by comparison, the risk of an outbreak associated with care home size is much, is much larger than any plausible risk from a hospital discharge, and the Cabinet Secretary has already described this. 3.7% of care homes with fewer than 20 registered places saw an outbreak over this period. 
And in comparison, care homes with more than 90 uh, places had 90.2% uh, 90 of care homes with more than 90 places saw an outbreak over the same period. So Public Health Scotland therefore noticed that hot, hot, hospital discharge was associated with increased risk of an outbreak when considered on its own. But however, they found that accounting for care home size and other characteristics, the estimated risk was not statistically significant. The Scottish Government will be taking forward the recommendations that PHS make in their report, and PHS will now carry out further work to give more detailed understanding of COVID-19 outbreaks in care homes. And where the report's conclusions highlight the need for additional measures, the Scottish Government will act on that. And I welcome the steps we've al we have already seen that have already been taken by the Government to ensure that we're discharged from hospital into care homes do take place that additional safeguards are in place, such as testing where clinically appropriate. Guidance has been clear that and any you must, individual And you must needs conclude. You must conclude. Okay. Thank you, President Officer. I will conclude. I welcome that the Thank Scottish you. Government will continue. Yeah, that, that conclude means conclude wherever you are on the planet. Thank you. I now call Neil Finlay, followed by Stuart McMillan. Officer, can I declare an interest? My mum is a resident in a care home and my wife and daughter work in the NHS. I have uh, never uh, worked in a care home and I have never been a resident in one. So with that in mind, I have to uh, relay what has been told to me by carers and those they care for. And I try to put myself in their position. So imagine it's March of this year and you're an 81-year-old patient in hospital. You've been there for six months and ready to go home for 12 weeks. And you've been told repeatedly that the reason you can't, go, can't leave hospital is that there's no care home place or package to support you. Imagine then being told at very short notice that a place has become available. You're moving today, not to your own community, but many miles away, not amongst the people you know, but you have to move as it's the only place available. Imagine on that same day watching TV, hearing that a virus is sweeping the world, resulting in deaths of hundreds of thousands of older people just like you. And you see the news bulletins showing multiple deaths at care homes across Europe with a haunting image of bodies being removed by undertakers. Imagine men being discharged alone <coughs> with limited family contact without your needs being assessed or you being tested. And imagine working in a care home on minimum wage in a place that's regularly short-staffed and has been for years and having to take in more Residents. Imagine that the company you work for can't provide you with appropriate and safe PPE to protect you, to keep your residents safe and allow you to do your job. And imagine at the same time that company, the company you work for is registering a tax haven, pays negligible corporation tax and posts regular very healthy profits. Imagine going home at night, every night, to see the news headlines of more and more people dying in care homes, just like the one you working. Imagine reading newspaper reports of multiple care home deaths, like what happened in Sky, and thinking, are we next? And imagine listening to politicians claiming we have the best testing capacity in the world at a time when neither you nor the residents you're caring for have ever been tested. Imagine caring for people who are COVID positive, who have become seriously ill, and then being told they must not be admitted to hospital for treatment. Imagine being COVID clear as a patient in hospital, then a few days after your move to a care home, finding yourself very ill from COVID. And imagine realising that as you worked untested, trying to keep people safe, that you were in fact inadvertently spreading COVID because you had never been tested. And imagine being vulnerable living amongst new people, people you don't know, seeing the COVID crisis growing, feeling scared and alone, and unable to hold the hand of your son and daughter or even speak to them. And imagine being asked to agree to a do not resuscitate order without a discussion with your GP or even your closest family. Imagine seeing your friends and neighbours and residents die without their family around them and being led to rest with a handful of mourners. Presiding officer, for too many of our mums and dads, our grandparents, our friends and family, they have no need to imagine these things. 
It happened to them in Scotland in 2020, and that is to our eternal shame. Thank you, Mr Finlay. And I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer. I welcome this short debate and, I'm, uh, and I thank the Conservatives for bringing it forward. And actually, at the outset, I do want to uh, agree with the comments of uh, Donald Cameron at the outset regarding, uh, uh, regarding staff and uh, the activities of the staff in the care homes uh, throughout this COVID pandemic. In preparation for this debate, I spoke to my staff just to, to clarify how many constituents have actually uh, are calling for an immediate public inquiry as per the Conservative motion in front of us, and, and the answer is none. Uh, I have had constituents contact me, uh, raising uh, some issues and some concerns about uh, certainly particularly PPE, but also access to some uh, care homes locally. But, uh, but in the main... Um, most constituents who have contacted me, uh, just let, let me finish my point, uh, but in the, main, in the main, most constituents who have contacted me about care homes uh, have actually been fairly positive about the experience they have actually had with the care homes. And certainly not one person, not one person has been calling for an immediate public inquiry as per this motion. Neil Finlay. Incredible, absolutely incredible. How many have contacted your office asking for a hate crime bill? How many have contacted your office asking for an independence referendum when all of this is going on? I, honestly, I cannot believe that you have the gall to stand up and say that in this parliament. It is shameful. Uh, but, uh, just if I could, you're wasting, wasting your debating time. Mr McMillan, I know this is a very sort of teacherly thing to say, but please don't use the term you in the chamber. I've said it over and over again. I like things to be proper. Mr McMillan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, Mr Finlay, that I, I just told what's been happening to my office, yes. uh, the number of constituents uh, who have been contacted my office. Right. And, and sorry if you don't, uh, sorry if, I'm sorry if Mr Finlay doesn't appreciate the fact that not one constituent has contacted my office asking for an immediate public inquiry. I'm sorry if, I'm sorry if members in this chamber don't actually accept that, but that is a fact. Yes. Uh, I, uh, officer, I actually, presenting officer, I, uh, I'm sorry, I've already given one. Uh, presenting officer, I actually do want a public inquiry to take place, but I genuinely do not think that the timing that as per the motion in front of this chamber is the right thing to do. Uh, presenting officer, uh, the families of over 2,000, sorry, the families of, of 2,048 residents who have passed away as a result of COVID-19 uh, do deserve to have answers as to what has happened. Absolutely correct, that should happen. But I, I, I believe that actually attempting to have an immediate public inquiry as per the motion in front of this chamber today, I think is the wrong thing to do. I mean, we're in the, we're in the midst of wave two uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. And I think we need to focus uh, on dealing with it, this pandemic that faces us at this present time. Uh, and, uh, and I believe, and also, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen post wave two. So I, I, and, uh, I genuinely believe that this chamber needs to appreciate that particular point. The First Minister and the Health Secretary have already confirmed uh, on multiple occasions that a public inquiry will be held. And we heard it again today from the Health Secretary uh, and uh, so looking into every single aspect of what has happened. Uh, and, and I generally believe that is the right thing to, to do. But I believe it's also vital for accountability, uh, but also to ensure that lessons are learned going forward. And our attention must still be on the crisis at hand to ensure that the event of a second wave of the virus, that we actually are as prepared as possible to deal with it. And I'm conscious of the time setting officer, so I do want a public inquiry, but not at this immediate time as per the motion in front of us. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. I call Jamie Halker Johnson, be followed by George Adam. Mr. Adam is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that we've been able to bring forward uh, this debate today because it's a vital one. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, some of our most vulnerable constituents have faced conditions and dangers that should cause enormous concern to members from across this parliament. We are all well aware of their plight and we, are all, uh, we all have responsibility to make sure these problems are addressed and quickly. But too often in this chamber, we have heard warm words about our older population 
respect, choice, dignity. Yet the reality has been quite different. Too often the Scottish Government has substituted rhetoric for real action. Our social care system remained low on their agenda. And the consequences of that, apparent for a very long time, are now even more clear. Because earlier this year our care homes faced a new virus, one which disproportionately affects the elderly and those with underlying health issues. But instead of action from the Scottish Government to support efforts to protect these residents, care homes saw their residents put at risk through the discharge of untested patients from hospital into care homes. The result is that these care homes, which should have been some of the most shielded settings, should have been sanctuaries for their elderly, vulnerable residents, have been battling COVID infections since the very start of the pandemic. The cost of that is stark. Over 2,000 residents lost their lives so far. I spoke recently in a debate about social care staff, and I recognise again, again their remarkable efforts and commitment. But these staff, while at the front line of the fight against COVID, have often been left at the back of the queue for help. They were late to get vital supplies of PPE, and they were late to be provided with adequate testing. In my own region, I saw directly how the testing regime pr promised by SNP ministers simply wasn't working. When one care home in Murray identified a, co a confirmed case of COVID, getting testing for staff and residents, testing that we were assured by the Health Secretary and the First Minister should be routine, was an almost impossible struggle. Despite the case being raised with the First Minister and with the Health Secretary in this chamber, it took two weeks for testing to start, and it was three weeks from identifying the first case for all results to come back. And what did those results find? Three further cases, two of them asymptomatic, both staff. Residents and staff put at further risk while government ministers here in Edinburgh gave assurances which bore no re relation to what was happening on the ground. Care home residents and their families and the staff who work in them still have deep concerns. And as we enter the early stages of the second wave, they remember the experiences of the first. And while we have to protect the physical health of care home residents, we mustn't ignore the importance of protecting their mental health. Too many have been unable to see family and friends, left isolated because safe visiting options have been for many completely absent. The impact that this is having on their mental health and their well-being is enormous. There have been too many stories of people coming to believe that life is not worth living, or most heartbreaking of all, dying alone without their loved ones around them. The Scottish Government must work with the social care sector to assure that guidance and resource is in place so care homes can allow for residents to safely see their families. Presiding officer, we don't know how long this virus will continue to be a threat. We don't know how long it will be and how long it will continue to separate families. We still don't know that all our care home residents are safe. We do know that too many have lost their lives already and more continue to be lost. So I fully support the need for an urgent judge-led independent inquiry, one which will look in more depth at the challenges the sector faced, the response of government and its agencies, and so lessons can be learned to stop more loss of life, to find out what has gone so badly wrong. Thank you very much. Now call George Adam, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Presiding officer, I wanted to take part in this debate today to hopefully help provide some reassurance and clarity to the families and loved ones of those who tragically lost their relatives in care homes and throughout this pandemic. None of us in this chamber are any stranger to the devastating statistics we saw coming out of care homes at the beginning of this pandemic. Some of my own constituents contacted me after losing their loved ones and to them I will continue to offer my deepest sympathies and condolences. But I also believe that the families of these residents have a right to know what happened and if the hospital discharges into care homes were to blame. Because after all, in this debate, presiding officer, the families of those who, uh, people who have lost uh, uh, members of their family are the most important people in this whole process. And that's why I'm glad when the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Jean Freeman, commissioned this report from, by Public Health Scotland on discharges. And it's been acknowledged from the start that the Scottish Government might get things wrong and it is important that in this case it was investigated and we learn from it. What we learned from this report is that hospital discharges into care homes had no significant impact on the risks of an outbreak in care homes but other factors like the size of the care home did 
We know that more residents in a care home, the more staff, the more visitors and community admissions, the higher the risk of COVID outbreak. Larger care homes have increased health care requirements, more people interacting with the home in, in order that it can run smoothly in all its operations. Only 3.7 per cent of care homes with less than 20 places had an outbreak between March and June, while 90.2 per cent of care homes had more than 90 places saw an outbreak during the exact same period. This dramatic difference to ha uh, to have a level of, uh, has a level of significance. The size and capacity of the care home is playing a major role here. There are many large care homes throughout Scotland and we need to further investigation to ensure that we get things right to ensure the safety of residents, staff and their families in these environments. We may have to look at different and radical ways to tackle this issue which has been highlighted by this pandemic. These are decisions which will be made in due course. Countries throughout the world are making very similar findings and we're not tackling this issue alone. And tackle it, the Scottish Government have. The Scottish Government did not waste time generating guidance to hospitals, care homes, that anyone leaving hospital in a care home should be tested. And for those who tested positive and where there was a clinical interest in them discharged, there was a mandatory risk assessment and 14-day isolation. The Cabinet Secretary has said time and again that the well-being of staff and residents in care home are one of our top priorities. And like everyone else in this debate, I congratulate them and thank them for their ongoing work. They are actively working with the Health Protection Scotland, local public health teams, health and social care partnerships and others in order to monitor, direct and guide service. The Care Inspectorate has given an enhanced role with enhanced duties in reporting and, last, and, and at least weekly, sometimes daily, uh, contact. Public Health Scotland are immediately told of COVID outbreaks in care homes and which allow them to provide specialist uh, infection control advice, guidance and a support. And I have confidence that the Scottish Government will take these findings of this new report and work with them and learn from them. Presiding Officer, in closing, I would like to say that while I support and acknowledge the need for an inquiry into what has happened here, I do not think that now is the best time. We need more information, we need more evidence and we need more time. And now is not the time to deal with this while we are going through a worldwide pandemic. We have to ensure that when we do this properly, presiding officer, it will be done and there will be some uh, legacy for residents in the future. Thank you very much. And I call Monica Lennon. Close for Labour. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, presiding officer. This has been an important debate and I'm grateful to all members for their contributions. In her opening remarks, the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm paraphrasing, um, she said that we are all committed to a public inquiry, so I accept that point. And she said that our only disagreement is on timing, but I think the timing is crucial. And Alison Johnson made a really considered contribution, and she said if we delay, there's no guarantee that we'll learn all the lessons that we need to learn, and we could put lives at risk. And I do acknowledge that the Scottish Government has made some really important commitments in, in recent weeks and in days, and I welcome that, and I think George Adam touched on that, but we need to, to go further. We can't afford to be slow and to be reactive. So I do welcome the adult social care uh, winter preparedness plan that was published yesterday. But I also reflect that GMB Scotland wrote to the First Minister back in March asking for a national plan for social care. Um, and a lot of the times we've been hearing that, oh, with the benefit of hindsight, we could have done X, Y and Z. But I want to pay tribute to those frontline workers, those low paid workers who have been speaking out from the very beginning of this pandemic. We owe it to them to act now. There are immediate issues that need to be raised. For example, in a briefing today, the RCN point out that um, or rather they ask where is the workforce going to come from to cover sickness absence and to support care homes during the winter period. We went into the pandemic with around 3,600 nursing and midwifery vacancies in the NHS. So we know we have big challenges to address now. Um, the clinical guidance for nursing home and care home residents was published on the 13th of March, updated 26th of March. It's been referenced already today. It also said that, and I quote directly from it, it is not advised that residents in long-term care are admitted to hospital for ongoing management, but are managed within their current 
setting. We've still not had a sufficient explanation as to why that guidance was in place. And a reassurance is our NHS is buckling under pressure once again that those same decisions won't happen. You know, colleagues have talked about the pressure for people to have do not attempt resuscitation orders in place. Hospital beds are filling up and we can't have a situation again where care home residents are denied access to hospitals. Um, I would also say that we're still seeing blockages in, in data. Members across this chamber are struggling to get responses to Freedom of Information request. And I was pleased last night that the Minister for Older People gave me a commitment that she would get me answers from NHS Lanarkshire on, on, on issues um, that I have raised about whether particular care homes did receive um, people who were COVID positive. The health board said they can't give that answer. So how can we be confident in the Public Health Scotland report that was published last week. I have a few seconds left. I want to pick up on points that Alex Cole Hamilton raised because the role of family caregivers is absolutely crucial. There's more we need to do. Infection prevention control should be an enabler to support families having contact. It shouldn't be a barrier. And I would also appeal to the Scottish Government to take on board the suggestion, not just from me, but from um, older people campaigners that we should in Scotland have an older people's commissioner. It's not a new idea. I think Alex Neil was raising it back in 2005, 2006. So let's get that done. If the motion is passed tonight, presiding officer, Scottish Labour will work constructively with the government and participate fully in cross-party efforts to shape the terms of the public inquiry, build public confidence and do everything we can to protect lives. Thank you very much. And I call Jean Freeman to close with the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, there is no question that a public inquiry should take place. But I want to be clear about a statutory public inquiry, and it should be statutory, uh, which, uh, what its requirements actually are. I welcome, as I said, a discussion across the Chamber on the draft remit and scope. And as Ms Lennon has said, and I agree with, and we will support her amendment, it should be a public inquiry that takes a human rights approach. But it will be for the judicial lead to finally determine its remit, its scope, and the information and the evidence he or she requires and how the inquiry will proceed. And I am sorry, but I do not believe that you can really examine the response of this government to the pandemic and get the answers that people seek and the answers that we need to learn from and apply by focusing solely on one aspect of that response, as the motion suggests. Alison Johnson set out very clearly exactly how a public inquiry goes about its business. And I believe in, that in doing so proved precisely my point. A public inquiry is not an immediate exercise. A public inquiry rightly takes time to do its job properly. And right now, no, I'm not taking any interventions. Right now, as case numbers rise, as we battle to again suppress the virus, as our NHS and social care staff, after what has already been a very tough year, gear up for a long and difficult winter, right now is not the right time to divert their resources to respond to the rightful demands of a public inquiry. I refute absolutely that this government is hiding, that it's spinning, that it's avoiding, any issues or demands on how we have responded to this pandemic or how we will in the weeks ahead? No, I won't. Presiding officer, Mr Finlay, no. No, I'm not avoiding anything, Mr Finlay. Uh, don't, All please, uh, excuse me to everyone. You can't have your little debate across the chamber. If the, if the member's not My taking apologies, intervention, excuse officer. me a minute, Cabinet Secretary, just sit down a second, please. Oh, right. Yes. When a member says they're not taking an intervention, I understand it means they're not taking an intervention. End of. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have only one final thing to say. Presiding Officer, the issue here is all about timing. It's all about when is the right thing to do right this moment and what is the right thing for this government, but also our NHS and social care staff to focus on, and that is to focus on how we continue to suppress this virus, how we steer our course safely through the coming months. Winter is always difficult. Winter in the context of a COVID pandemic will be even more difficult for every single one of us, but mostly it will be difficult for our frontline NHS and social care staff. And I do not believe that this is the right time to divert that resource away from the important work they do so very well 
in order to set up an immediate public inquiry. There will be a public inquiry. I will work across this chamber with colleagues to agree the draft remit, and we will go ahead and do that when we are through the immediacy of the immediate pandemic. And I believe members should support the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call Brian Whittle to close to the Conservatives. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm very pleased to be closing this important debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Can I start, as others have done, by thanking the incredible staff and carers who have looked after our most vulnerable in such difficult times with such dedication and professionalism. There are so many stories of compassion and that dedication, and it is important when we have these debates, we always caveat our comments by acknowledging the debt that we owe our care staff and our NHS staff. Now, Presiding Officer, we are all aware of the difficult decisions that no government would want to have to make. It is very clear that governments across the world have struggled to create a route out of this crisis. And that is why when the Scottish Conservatives uh, 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 called, or sorry, the Scottish Government called for the cross-party support of its efforts to tackle COVID-19, the Scottish Conservatives put party politics aside, as did all other parties in this chamber, recognising the seriousness of the situation. Now, that does not mean that opposition parties would waive their right to scrutiny of the Scottish Government. The subject, this subject again returns to this chamber because it is so important. Moreover, it is the lack of satisfactory answers to consistent parliamentary questions and scrutiny that will ensure it will continue to seek answers to the many, many constituent questions that we continue to be asked on the continuing care home tragedy. Let's be absolutely clear here. All government responses, including those of other UK nations, have been seriously flawed. This is not time to hide behind party politics. However, it is our job in this place to scrutinise and question Scottish Government decisions. And I know that I and many of my colleagues continually raise the care home crisis with the Scottish Government on behalf of our constituents. Hardly a day goes by without care homes being the subject of emails and phone calls to my office. And it does seem increasingly clear to me that there has been mistake after mistake in handling the most vulnerable in our society. As has been said in Scotland, there has been 2,048 tragic deaths from COVID in care homes since the start of the pandemic, some 45% of all COVID deaths. A Public Health Scotland report revealed that over 113 patients were sent to care homes despite testing positive for COVID, with some 3,061 patients being discharged into care homes without being tested. Now, presenting officer, the Cabinet Secretary did recognise the risk to, of, of patients being transferred into care homes. But I think citing clinical decisions or advice surely cannot be acceptable. And I listened to Neil Finlay's speech, which I thought was a very good speech, and I'm sure he would agree with me that him and I are not clinicians. But I don't need a clinician to work out for ourselves that transferring positive COVID patients into care home environment is extremely da dangerous, especially given the R number estimated at over 10 in that environment. And I have to say to George Adam that a reason that care homes with the greatest capacity have the greatest level of COVID outbreaks might be because they accepted most of the COVID positive cases into the care homes. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I, I, I was acknowledged and accepted right at the start of this crisis that mistakes would be made. The main and recurring issue I have is the Scottish Government's continual attempts to hide the truth, to hide from simple parliamentary scrutiny. Take that simple question. When did you know that COVID positive patients or patients who had not had a test were being transferred into care homes? How many times has that question gone unanswered? Had it been answered the very first time with a degree of honesty, it wouldn't be the issue it has now become. The biggest question in my mind has been around the Scottish Government's initial response and lack of learning since that time. We watched the virus begin in China, move across the world, move across Europe towards us with devastating effect in countries like Italy, Spain and France, especially on our most vulnerable, yet we were still caught unprepared. I asked the Cabinet Secretary about that and her response was, we did the same as everybody else. Why did you do the same as everybody else? What different outcome did you expect? The wise learn from mistakes and the truly wise learn from other people's mistakes. Protection of the most vulnerable in our society should have been better than it has been. 
And even now, after nine months of the pandemic, with all we have learned, the care home sector is still being let down by the Scottish Government. Not only have we had too many care home residents tragically losing their lives to COVID, too many are still being denied contact with loved ones during the twilight of their lives. And I have raised this point many times in the Chamber. The Care Inspectorate, under the guidance of the Scottish Government, has significant influence over the way in which care homes are run, both private and council. Surely it is not above the wit of the Scottish Government um, to ensure that COVID-safe environments indoors were created in all care homes. Instead, we have heard over and over of short meetings with loved ones outdoors in poor conditions. Now, this tells me the Scottish Government are not looking ahead. They're not planning ahead and they're not learning the lessons that must be learned, which is exactly why a public inquiry is essential now. Because as Alison Johnson said in her speech, lessons have not been learned and cannot be learned if the Scottish Government refused to accede to proper parliamentary scrutiny and answering straight questions. Um, as I said, it was accepted that mistakes would be made. Advice would be ever-changing as we learned more about the virus. But keeping Parliament away from effective scrutiny only raises Parliament's suspicions more. Deputy Presiding Officer, this virus is not going away, despite what many of us thought would happen by now. The response from across the world, including the Scottish Government, has been far less sophisticated than it should have been by now. It is time to take a breath. Terrible decisions have been placed in front of governments. We all recognise that. But, uh, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government must also own their own poor decisions and their mistakes. They must instruct a public inquiry now that will answer the public queries from those who have lost loved ones. Then we'll be able to map ahead a more cohesive and compassionate route out of this crisis that we'll have, we can all have confidence in. Care home residents, care home staff and families and loved ones deserve that at the very least. I would ask the Chamber to support the motion in the name of Donald Cameron. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. And that concludes the debate on care homes and there'll be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you very much, colleagues. Our next item is consideration of business motion 23234 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on the business manager to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Day. Uh, no member has asked to speak on the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 23234 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, thank you. The next item is consideration of business motions 23235 and 23236 on the stage one timetable for two bills. Again, could I call on Graeme Day to move these two motions? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, no member has asked to speak on the, question, on the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 23235 and 23236 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of four Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I call on Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 23237 on stage two consideration of a bill and 23238 to 23240 on approval of SSIs? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. And we'll take these ones at decision time, to which we now turn. Oh, point of order, Andy Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's just come to my attention that an email has been circulated to members that um, there's an updated Blue Jeans link. This email was sent at 1704 for a decision time at 1710. Uh, I'm sure the presiding officer is aware of that, but it occurs to me that there may well be, uh, given that you have to be on blue jeans and present, there may well be some difficulties th th this evening, given that it's a tight vote. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that uh, particular invitation is the online equivalent of the bell that we ring to summon members to the chamber. In other words, members will have been invited onto the Blue Jeans platform who are working virtually or remotely uh, much earlier in the day and will have had the opportunity to join. And that particular email goes out as a reminder to make sure and to give them a final chance to go in. Mr. White. If I could, 
uh, come back. The, the email is headed in, in red bold. Apologies. Please note the updated blue jeans link, which is now below. That does rather suggest to me that there may be some issues in terms of timing. I will just take some advice. Hang on. Uh, thank you, Mr Whiteman, um, for uh, illuminating the Chamber and me with uh, the, the nature of the email link. It was the wrong connection. We now have 60 members have joined on uh, the new link, so we hope that it is working. But we will take some extra time, in, in, if necessary, uh, to allow to make sure that all members are on board. And we will check. We always check who's missing and who's not. Um, so we turn to decision time. The first question. Is that amendment 23218.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion 23218 in the name of Murdo Fraser on Scottish Government handling of harassment complaints be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a vote, and because we need to allow everybody to access the voting app, we will suspend business temporarily uh, and allow people to open the app. So business is suspended for a few moments.
Colleagues, we're going to... Thank you very much, colleagues. We are now resuming uh, our vote. So we're going straight to the vote. The question is that Amendment 23218.2, in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend Motion 23218, in the name of Murdo Fraser, on Scottish Government handling of harassment complaints, be agreed. And members may cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division. That is the vote closed. I would just urge any member who wasn't able to exercise their vote or thinks there was a, an issue to let me know, either in point of order in the Chamber. Yeah, point of order, Keith Brown. Yeah, officer, I wasn't able to connect. I would have voted yes on that vote. Thank you very much, Mr Brown. So I will make sure that is added to the voting roll. Keith Brown would have voted yes to the John Swinney Amendment. And if there's anybody online... Richard Leonard. Calling Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, I wasn't able to vote online. Uh, I would have voted no. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I'll instruct the clerks to add your vote to the voting roll. You voted no. The result of the vote on amendment number 23218.2 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 55, no, 63. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 23218 in the name of Murdo Fraser on Scottish Government handling of harassment complaints be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. This will be a one minute division again. That vote is now closed. If any member has any issues, please let me know, either online or by making a point of order in the chamber.
The result of the vote on motion 23218 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes, 63, no, 54. There were five abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. Now, can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Jean Freeman is agreed, the amendment in the name of Monica Lennon will fall. The question is the amendment 23226.2 in the name of Jean Freeman, which seeks to amend motion 23226 in the name of Donald Cameron on care homes, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. That vote is closed. If members have any issues or did not think their vote was recorded, Jackie Bailey. Point of order, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Um, my vote wasn't recorded and I would have voted no. Thank you very much, Ms Bailey. I will make sure that your vote is added to the register. Point of Kevin. order, presiding officer. Point of order, um, Kevin Stewart. My phone went a bit weird at the end there too. I would have voted yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Stewart. I'll make sure, <laughs> sure Mr Stewart that his vote was recorded, but that is noted. Daniel Johnson, point of order. Daniel, I fear there's a, somewhat of a Bermuda Triangle of Wi-Fi here, but my phone went funny too, and I'd have voted no. And I can assure Mr Johnson his also was recorded. Thank you very much. Hey, officer, I'm afraid we have a rhombus rather than a triangle now. Um, <laughs> my, my, my connection was lost moments before the vote was concluded, so I'm unaware whether or not it has counted. I would have voted yes. And your vote also was recorded. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr Doris. Can I call Ruth Davidson? Thank you, Presiding Officer. My phone has frozen. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Davidson. But I can assure you, your vote was recorded in this case, but thank you for the notification. Thank you. <laughs> the result of the vote. On amendment number 23226.2 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes, 60, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 23226.1 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Donald Cameron on care homes be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 23226 in the name of Donald Cameron as amended on care homes be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. This will be a one minute division again.
I'm afraid that vote is now closed, but any members who did not have the chance to vote can make a point of order at this stage. Point of order, Joe Fitzpatrick. If phone didn't refresh and I would have abstained. Thank you, Mr Fitzpatrick. That will be noted and added to the voter register. Sorry, point of order, Adam McKee. Yeah, um, my, uh, didn't refresh and I would also have abstained. Thank you, Mr McKee. That will be added to the voter roll as well. Thank you. Point of order, Alistair Allen, online. Alistair Allen. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Likewise, the connection didn't work on the phone, so I would have abstained. Thank you, Mr Allen. That is noted and will be added to the voter roll. And point of order, Hamza Youssef. <coughs> Hamza Youssef, a point of order. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was having some connection issues and I would have voted to abstain. Thank you very much. I think I heard that as you would have voted to abstain and that will be added to the voters' roll. Thank you. And point of order, Joe McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My phone also uh, froze and I would like to abstain. Thank you very much, Joe McAlpine. I will make sure that the clerks register your abstention on the voters' roll. Aileen Campbell, I believe you want a point of order, but I can tell you your vote was registered. Okay, so it was my connection dropped as well. I would have voted to abstain, but if, if it's been registered, that's uh, reassuring. Thank you. It has been. I can offer you that reassurance. I can also reassure Beatrice Wishart that her point that her vote was also registered. Thank you. There have been no references to the Supreme Court, so we're okay. The result of the vote on motion 23226 in the name of Donald Cameron, as amended, is yes 64, no 1, and there are 57 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now I propose to ask a single question on the four parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? The question is that motions 23237 to 23240 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. So that concludes decision time. Oh. Point of order, Deputy First Minister John Swinney. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In light of the vote that we just had on the Conservative motion on the Committee on Harassment, let me confirm that Ministers always seek to respect the decisions taken by Parliament. I will now consider the implications of the motion with my ministerial colleagues consistent with our obligation in the Ministerial Code and will advise Parliament accordingly of our response. Thank you very much, Deputy First Minister, and hopefully that will have pre-empted any other points of order. Point of order, point of order Neil Findlay. I, 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 I thank the Deputy First Minister for that statement, but we've not heard a similar statement from the Cabinet Secretary for Health, and I wonder if she's intimated to you whether she will make a similar statement. Uh, that's not a point of order for me. However, I can assure the member that the government will be aware of the decision that the Parliament has taken and will, there is an expectation that the government will respond appropriately and in a reasonable time. Thank you very much, colleagues. That concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Angela Constance. But I would just urge members who have to leave at the moment to be careful observing social distancing while they do. And there'll be a short pause before we resume business. So just observe social distancing when leaving the chamber, wear masks at all times. Thank you.